talk about singing. Oh, the spirituals choir. Well, first of all, um, the NAACP always had a gospel choir for many years. And that was what Myra Romaine, do you remember her? Who was an attorney as well. Myra had a beautiful voice. Okay. So when Myra left, there was no choir. And um, Arlene Bodge, Reverend Arlene Bodge and myself, we were on our, taking a trip to Europe. And uh, on the plane, we were discussing why we didn't have another choir for the NAACP. Well, we said, well, somebody has to start it. So Arlene and I said, okay, well, we'll ask around when we get back to the vineyard. So right away, we started uh, talking about uh, maybe a choir starting up. But anyway, it's Georgia, Georgia Franklin. Remember Georgia Franklin? Okay, thank you. So Georgia said, oh yeah, let, let me make a call. So she calls, calls Jim Thomas, James Thomas, who has a beautiful voice and has sung all over the world. And uh, he worked for the American Red Cross, one of their administrators, traveled the worldwide. And we said to him, um, would you be willing to come here and help us start a choir? Well, we said gospel. He says, well, I don't do gospel. So we said, well, what do you do? So he says, I only do spiritual. So we said, well, what's the difference? And he started educating. So the educational piece came into focus. And we learned, and we all fell in love. And we said, you have to be here. Then he says, well, I come anyway. I have a home right in Oak Bluffs. I'm on New York Ave. So we said, well, you got to do it. So that was the beginning of the NAACP Spirituals Choir. And I started singing a lot uh, as a kid in school and in church. And um, I had my mom, my dad, and my sister all sang as well. Then I went to Fisk University. Fisk. Oh, a, yes. In Nashville, Tennessee. And at Fisk, I was asked to join the Fisk Jubilee Singers and sang with them for six years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my interest in spirituals actually predates all of that. My great-grandmother was born a slave. Okay. And I knew her uh, through my early teens and would spend many of my summers with her in her cabin mm -hmm. where she told me a lot of the stories of the old days and uh, what some of those songs meant. The singing of spirituals, it tells a story. A lot of the Negro spirituals tells you about slavery and it explains to you how they were able to escape if you listen to some of the words and some of the people that were in songs, for example, Moses, so that would be Harriet Tubman. She was leading the people through the waters and through, through shootings and the lynchings. It's just, oh my goodness, it just makes your heart feel sad, but good that you could help educate people through song. That's it, educating people through song by way of learning through Jim Thomas' teachings and then us doing our research as well. He's such a, a remarkable person and he loves teaching and he loves singing. And he will tell you, I didn't ask you to come here as a professional. I ask you to just learn about the spirituals, learn about slavery, close your eyes and feel as you sing those words. Think about what the people were going through. And believe me, it's just, it's just so heartfelt. It really is. If on my way out of this earthly place, if I could be singing a spiritual, that would be a wonderful thing, a wonderful gift, or hearing one on my way out. And so with Jim, how often do you meet? Well, normally before the pandemic, we would meet every single, every week, every Wednesday at Windermere in the recreation room. That was our practice. Wednesday evenings, we practiced for an hour, an hour and a half. That was just straight singing and then education, 
you know, more education about slavery. And then we had um, concerts that we gave all over the island. So everybody's saying, when are you all getting back? Well, we're saying as soon as it's safe, we will be back. And when you practiced at Windermere, Yes. When, um, people who lived at Windermere. Oh, they loved it. Some of the some of the residents. Oh, they couldn't wait. They knew they would be in the dining room. A lot of them would be in the dining room, and they would see us all piling in, and they'd be waving. And sure enough, oh my gosh! And you know the old folks. They know all the old hymns, and the spirituals and all, and they'd be clapping, and the heads are going, the feet are going, and oh my God, it would make you feel so good. And so we do some little extra things too. And we always gave a concert at the end of the summer for the Windermere group and invite those who had been coming to listen to us and to sing along with us to sing too. Oh, it was so much fun. And we want, we want to do that again whenever we can. We love it. It just makes your heart feel good. You know, when you can help other people, when you can help somebody, it's got to make you feel good. It has to. And I can share a tape with you of the, uh, the original choir. They were singing for the president of the NAACP, and we had it at the uh, PAC Center. It was lovely. And I will share with you that you could share with others as well. The last speech that we will sing is Live a Humble. Live a Humble is an interesting piece for several reasons. It has three verses. The first verse contains the code. The code was, if there was a straggler along the way during the work day, you had to tell them to catch up or the entire team could be beaten at the end of the day. So it's the watch the sun verse. That's the code. Live a humble, humble, humble. Steady he runs, don't let him catch you with your work undone. Live a humble, 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 humble yourself.